My name is Michael Guyad, publisher of the Lead Lag Report. Join me there is Altea Spinozzi. Uh, I'll tell you, introduce yourself to the audience and to me formally. Who are you? What's your background? What have you done throughout your career? And what are you doing currently? Yeah, absolutely, Michael. So I'm a head of fixed income uh, strategy here at Saxo Bank. Uh, and uh, I, my background uh, is always been uh, in fixed income for more than uh, 12 years. I've been covering European sovereigns. U.S. sovereigns uh, and also corporate uh, bonds uh, on in uh, both uh, continents. Uh, cor- uh, currently, my focus is more on uh, rates and uh, central banks and monetary policies. So, I hope to be helpful for you all today. So, twelve years, of course, overlaps with uh, the eurozone crisis of 2011, when the what they termed the pigs were all the rage in terms of yields blowing out on the sovereign side. Clearly an exciting time to be a fixed income strategist then. I am curious if what's happened the last three years has been maybe more exciting from a career perspective, given what's happened in duration. Absolutely. And what is exciting about the the past three years is inflation. You see the problem with uh, the European sovereign crisis in uh, 2011, 2012 was more about uh, politics and uh, underlying uh, sovereign stress uh, in uh, within the European countries. Uh, being an Italian was a very much heartfelt for myself as well. Uh, but what is interesting is that uh, this kind of inflation uh, in the past three years uh, has never been seen uh, since uh, the 80s. And myself, and I'm sure many others, uh, uh, were not expecting uh, such a high wave in inflation uh, in the past couple of years to come. What's the difference in in the sovereign stress from that 2011 crisis with Europe to what the U.S. and really all governments have gone through the last three years? Because when I hear stress, my mind goes to volatility. And we've seen you know, some of the greatest volatility really in history when it comes to long duration treasuries. Absolutely. I think that the main uh, difference is the way that investors are looking at bonds and how uh, they price them. You see, in uh, the sovereign uh, period of time, uh, um, investors were looking at the specific sovereigns within uh, the European Union, and they were demanding a higher yield in order to hold uh, these securities. Now, if we look at uh, U.S. treasuries today, well, the term premium is uh, below zero. So it means that effectively investors are not demanding a pickup uh, over uh, what nominal yields are representing, uh, so meaning uh, real rates, the break-even rates uh, uh, at this point in time. So, But I think, Michael, that might change. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, we have seen that already in the last quarter of uh, 2023, when uh, the term premium on 10-year U.S. Treasuries uh, rose uh, again, in positive territory and hit uh, 40 basis points. And uh, that uh, is just a sign that investors uh, start to price the risk of holding uh, these uh, long-term securities uh, in their portfolio. Shouldn't that mean that corporate credit must at some point respond? I mean, the entire financial system is predicated on RF, right? The risk-free rate. And if the idea is that there's now pricing in of risk on the U.S. government debt side, I would think we would see credit spreads start to widen at some point. Absolutely. Right now, the corporate spread, but especially junk bond spreads, are the tightest that we have seen since before the COVID pandemic. The, if we look at how much junk bonds are paying over, for example, investment grade corporate bonds, they're paying only around 200 basis points. Uh, that has been a minimum uh, within uh, the past uh, 10 years. Uh, but uh, when we look at the Fed fund rate, uh, we see that it remains uh, the highest that uh, we have seen since 2000 until today. So uh, you are absolutely right, Michael. And that's why when I look at uh, the bond market, I really dislike risk, credit risk at the moment. I dislike uh, ultra long uh, duration and I prefer quality. I prefer sovereigns uh, and maybe, you know, as uh, central banks are preparing to cut rates, extend some duration within uh, this space uh, rather than picking uh, risk uh, among the credit uh, bond space. Yeah. And, and it's, I mean, I've been saying this to financial advisors that I talk to, but, you know, a lot of people will say, 
it was obvious that we we're going to enter a cycle where thoughts and bonds would both sell off. And my response to that is, okay, you can argue it was obvious, but I don't think anybody had on their bingo cards, you'd have the fastest rate hike cycle in history from the Federal Reserve. You'd have the duration crash and credit spreads, just you know, junk versus AAA, to your point, would be at cycle lows at this point. Has that dynamic been surprising? I mean, that, that, I've been early and wrong in arguing that you know, inevitably a duration crash will result in a credit crash. But I still think there's a possibility for that if the lags are still in place. Yes, for us, it has been surprising, actually. And the reason is that benchmark rates are the highest we have seen. But I think, Michael, uh, what has been really supporting uh, credit spread at the moment uh, has been this uh, kind of delay in uh, refinancing uh, of uh, coupon maturities coming up. You see, like uh, last year and also this year, we have... uh, uh, very little corporate bonds uh, maturing. So uh, corporate bond market is not testing uh, the primary market uh, really at this point in time. And I'm talking about ju- uh, junk bonds because uh, we have seen a lot of uh, investment grade supply in January and February this year. Uh, but junk bonds, especially like the cash straps one, they don't have a reason to go in the primary market and raise uh, debt at this moment in time uh, with uh, basically absolute nominal yields uh, to be the highest that they have seen since the global financial crisis until today. And is it, is it fair to say that th- there's, a, there's an effect of low credit spread essentially is a, is a reflationary or inflationary source, whereas rising spreads are more of a disinflation deflationary force? You can put it uh, that way, uh, but really... If we look at inflation uh, or disinflation, uh, at this point in time, the kind of pace of disinflation is going to weigh on credit, uh, exactly like it will weigh on uh, sovereign bonds. And the reason for that is that uh, we have seen quite an uptick of disinflation uh, in the past uh, few months, uh, but there there are signs uh, of uh, stabilization uh, in in the high twos uh, at this moment in time, uh, even Tomorrow, CPI numbers, uh, they are expected basically uh, the headlines around 3.1 uh, to, remind, to remain the same as uh, January and uh, the, the core CPI to adjust slightly uh, lower. The, um, the point about signs of stabilization is, I think, leads into a discussion around QT quantitative tightening. You sent a note saying tapering is coming sooner than most expect. Uh, it's not going to be, it doesn't mean it's going to be good for duration, which maybe we can debate a little bit, but... Let's talk about the state of the Fed's balance sheet, uh, quantity of tightening in the context of the signs of stabilization. Yeah, so what's happening here with uh, quantitative tightening and the reason why the Federal Reserve uh, is uh, starting to speak about that uh, is that uh, it realizes uh, that uh, in the quantitative tightening at this pace of my start uh, to put a strain on liquidity and uh, that's going to be a problem uh, for the Federal Reserve uh, you see, if uh, we look at re- coupon redemptions in, in the next uh, 12 months, if the Federal Reserve uh, doesn't uh, adjust uh, the cap on U.S. treasuries uh, uh, that are going to be run off uh, from the balance sheet, uh, well, we are going to have around 170 billion T-bills running, uh, running off uh, from uh, the Federal Reserve balance sheet uh, uh, in just one year. And we had... Uh, Around 10 days ago, Waller saying uh, that uh, they want to increase uh, T-bills, uh, the size of T-bills uh, in the Fed uh, balance sheet, uh, while decreasing uh, the ones of coupon uh, treasuries. So I think that the quantitative tightening at this point in time, uh, tapering uh, is going to be necessary because uh, the Federal Reserve needs uh, ample liquidity. They don't know exactly what ample liquidity means. There are some research from uh, the St. Louis Fed that points it out to be around uh, 10 to 12 percent of GDP. So between three to 3.3 trillion. But uh, we are awfully close to that level if the Federal Reserve doesn't taper quantitative tightening. So as I recall, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, when the Fed was expanding its balance sheet and buying long duration treasuries, Mm. yields would actually rise, right? Even though they were buying them up, the market saw that as expansionary. And then as they tried to do tapering or reducing, as our coal yields fell. So it was a very much a kind of counterintuitive type of movement. 
is there a situation where the Fed could sell into the market that the market would absorb it and maybe uh, result in sort of a, an opposite reaction on long duration yields than they might want or expect? Well, right now, the Federal Reserve is not actively selling uh, U.S. Treasuries, but there has been an instance uh, in the Federal Reserve history, which is around 2012, uh, where the Federal Reserve started to sell actively T-bills to buy long-term uh, U.S. Uh, treasuries. And that was uh, to decrease uh, um, the yield on that part of the yield curve. According to Waller's comment, uh, well, they now want to do the opposite. So I don't exclude that they might want to sell actively long-term U.S. treasuries to buy short-term U.S. treasuries. And the reason for that is that realistically, the yield curve remains very much inverted and the Federal Reserve needs um, a steeper yield curve uh, in order to curb uh, inflation successfully because we can say that, well, they have been saying, actually, the Federal Reserve members have been saying that uh, their mon uh, monetary policy stance have been uh, restrictive enough, uh, but we have seen uh, that uh, GDP continues to grow uptrend or below or, or above, uh, apologize, and uh, that is a sign that actually they are uh, monetary policy stance is not restrictive enough. And the only way to become more restrictive uh, is uh, to make sure that the long part of the yield curve rises. I guess the question is how much of that can they fully control, right? I mean, sort of finance 101 is, you know, the Fed control is the short end, not the long end. And as much as they've done QE and QT, you know, it seems like there's some evidence that suggests that's still largely market driven. So they, they may need it, but I guess the question is how much can they really affect it? Well, yes, absolutely. It's much harder for the Federal Reserve to affect um, uh, long-term yields because uh, the way that uh, long-term yields uh, work is that they price uh, according uh, to uh, market expectations on growth. And that's what we have seen in the past few weeks. Uh, as soon as the market uh, sees signs of a recession, we have the 10 years uh, dropping uh, then uh, it also prices on uh, uh, inflation expectations. And if inflation expectations uh, have become somewhere hunkered above uh, uh, 2% levels, uh, uh, then that's also negative for this part of the year curve. But also, Michael, going back to the term premium, I think that's very important. Because what happens now is that the 10-year U.S. Treasury yields uh, around uh, 4% is telling me that there is going to be a soft landing because uh, it's basically showing me that uh, there is going to be growth around uh, 2%, inflation uh, around uh, 2%, and that's the description of a, of, of a soft landing. But what if uh, the Federal Reserve starts to taper quantitative tightening and at the same time, let's say in June, begins to cut rates uh, well, that and inflation, it's still not at 2%. At that point, uh, basically, we can have a resurgence of bond vigilante and they're going to say, well, I don't want to hold 10-year yields at 4% because there might be a risk of a rebound in inflation because of the behavior and the decisions of the Federal Reserve uh, and the term premium might rise. And that's why I think that the 10 years uh, at 4% uh, Right now, the fair value should be more closer to 5%. But still, when you look at uh, the, the offering that the 10 years has on a balanced portfolio, it makes sense if you want to hedge against that downturn. What other dynamic could have the effect of a 5% type of fair value rate where the Fed wouldn't be the, the cause of it? I'm thinking in terms of, you know, currency movement, if the dollar were to have a spike, that's a disinflationary force, you know, that's a form of tightening or broader volatility in risk assets. I mean, it, it seems like you could still get to a restrictive place, but you need the Fed to not be the, the primary source of that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that the Federal Reserve is scared of that prospect because, uh, we had uh, the Federal Reserve pivoting in December after basically 10-year yields uh, uh, hit 5% uh, in November. And uh, the Federal Reserve pivoted uh, in December despite uh, having uh, five uh, quarters of U.S. GDP above trend and inflation still being uh, above 3%. 
Uh, Michael, I think that the Federal Reserve uh, is political, but we cannot hide the fact uh, that 2024 is all about uh, the U.S. election. And the Federal Reserve is composed by human beings uh, that are going to vote uh, in that elections. So when they look at the real rates, slightly below 2%, uh, they are panicking, believing that they might be too restrictive and and the economy might uh, suffer, uh, let's say, just before the U.S. election in summer. And basically, it would uh, compromise uh, the outcome of the U.S. election or will influence it. So what is happening here, I think that uh, they are going along with this kind of preventing uh, preemptive uh, uh, cuts and preemptive uh, quantitative tightening tapering uh, just because uh, they are afraid that something might break close enough to the U.S. election. You actually read my mind on that. I saw a headline that said that Biden predicts the federal cut rates this year. And it's like, all right, now they're just kind of outright saying it, right? Not even hiding it. But the political side of it is an interesting discussion. It's it's not clear to me if it's politically bad for them to, or good for them to lower rates in advance of an election, just because if they lower rates, they're going to be accused by the Republicans of supporting the Democrats. If they don't lower rates, then Republicans will say, look at the Democrats, that they're making the cost of money so high for you. So it seems like the Fed, either way, doesn't win, doesn't win politically. Absolutely. And the Federal Reserve is trying to find a balancing act, really, in order to get to those U.S. elections. But also, like we said before, if the Federal Reserve cut rates and the market is not sure that uh, inflation it is under control, then bond vigilantes uh, can ask for a higher term premium and uh, the 10 years can go rapidly towards five uh, percent, and that's obviously a very bad situation for this uh, for the Federal Reserve. So I I really believe that what the Federal Reserve is going to do is tapering at first uh, quantitative tightening, and the reason for that is that it makes sense because the runoff of T bills accelerate since June. They are going uh, they are going to assess uh, the tapering, uh, how it's going to affect the uh, bond markets and the uh, look how uh, inflation uh, is going to behave. And then they are going to follow up uh, with uh, rate cuts. But to be clear, Michael, I don't think there is going to be a rate cut in September. It has to become, it has to happen either after or before. And it's very likely that if the Federal Reserve believes that, that there is some sort of stress in markets is going to cut before. So this went directly to a conversation around the name of the space, which I changed a few times, but talking about how Japan and monetary policy from the BOJ uh, could impact U.S. markets. I put a, a post out there, which sounds a little conspiratorial, was meant to be a little bit dramatic, but uh, basically said something along the lines of the Fed may want the Bank of Japan to cause some volatility through the reversal of the carry trade to give them an excuse and for Japan to maybe be a scapegoat as far as them responding to volatility that could come from whatever the Bank of Japan does next and how that kind of metastasizes across the globe. So let's let's talk about the importance of the Bank of Japan when it comes to global leverage and what is, in your opinion, coming. It does seem like they're going to act and it's not clear what the secondary tertiary effects are going to be. Well, it seems... Uh, very much that uh, the Bank of Japan is going to act because uh, the modus operandi of the Bank of Japan is that it leaks stories uh, uh, to the media. And uh, we had several stories uh, from the Bank of Japan, uh, from various uh, medias in, in, in Japan saying that, that the Bank of Japan is willing uh, to exit Yonker control as soon as this month and hike rates. So I think that uh, it is really coming. And uh, what does that mean? Well, before considering what does that mean for U.S. treasuries, we have to consider that uh, Japanese investors hold around 15% of all U.S. treasuries outside of Japan. So if they stop buying U.S. treasuries or even European sovereign bonds, that is going to be a blow for the U.S. treasuries and that is going to show off as higher yields on both sides uh, of the Atlantic. So they, just uh, to understand uh, how Japanese 
investors buy U.S. treasuries. They normally have to hedge this position against the Japanese yen. And uh, so they are going to buy, for example, 10-year U.S. treasuries, and then they are going to sell uh, dollar yen forward, three months forward. If uh, you do that right now, you would secure uh, a yield of minus uh, 1.2%. And Japanese investors, uh, they can get uh, 0.7%, 75% on uh, their 10 years uh, JGB. So it doesn't make sense for them to buy 10-year U.S. treasuries. You can uh, argue that uh, they might want uh, to buy 10-year U.S. treasuries uh, unedged. But even like that, if we have the Federal Reserve telling us that, that they are going to cut rates and we have the, ja- the Bank of Japan telling us that they are going to hike rates, uh, is not convenient uh, for Japanese investors to buy 10-year U.S. treasuries either. So, Michael, it all comes uh, to what happens also to U.S. treasury auctions because the U.S. treasury is uh, selling uh, an amount uh, at every auction that is uh, um, equal or above uh, pandemic levels. So the last month, uh, the U.S. Treasury has sold 42 billion 10 years notes. This month, uh, actually tomorrow, the U.S. Treasury is selling uh, 39 billion uh, 10 year uh, U.S. notes. Uh, and that's uh, the amount that we have seen uh, during the pandemic. If we don't have the Federal Reserve buying, we don't have a Japanese investor buying. The reason, the, the question is, is the demand coming from everybody else enough to absorb uh, this kind of supply? And I think that we are going to be answered that question already tomorrow. And what I'm going to look at that 10 year U.S. Treasury auction is the indirect bidders. I want to see indirect bidders that can be not only foreign investors, also other investors that are not buying directly from the U.S. Uh, Treasury. But it's still, it's, it, it gives an idea of how much demand outside of traditional buyers there for U.S. treasuries. And that can spark, that, that can basic, basically be a volatility kind of, it can cause volatility in, in bond markets, especially on the back of the uh, C, uh, CPI print. So it's interesting you say that the, um, the point about, you know, where the demand come from. And I was loud about this last year. Obviously, my timing was not ideal, but. I did show data that shows that historically in the top 1% of stock market declines, there is this flight to safety that happens into treasuries, into duration. I've used that line before that, you know, to save bonds, you have to crash stocks, or at least to save treasuries, you have to crash stocks because it creates the flight to quality, flight to safety sequence for a moment in time. Right? Treasuries tend to drop and yield during extreme tail events for equities in a concentrated way. Is there a possibility that that may be sort of the way we get past this demand issue that it could just be absorbed by scared money and risk on assets if Japan decides to no longer buy treasuries and uh, the Fed is doing tapering? Or is the supply so overwhelming that's unlikely? I think that it's likely that that we are going to have, that that this kind of supply is going to be absorbed uh, by markets uh, um, let, let's bear in mind that in every U.S. Treasury auction, there is a, there are always primary dealers that are buying whatever is not bought by indirect and direct uh, uh, bidders. Uh, but said so, if uh, we have uh, some sort of volatility that is going to affect uh, um, equity uh, markets, uh, it's very likely to see that uh, rotation from basically stocks to bonds. But the big question is uh, which bonds are going to be picked up. And that's why when I tell you, um, yes, 10-year yields might rise to 5%, but I would still like uh, to have uh, them in my portfolio. I would like to have a 10-year U.S. treasuries in my portfolio. Why, if you think that basically the 10-year yields is going to go to 5%? Well, because if I'm a buy to hold investors and I try to make... uh, some sort of risk reward analysis uh, on the 10 year US Treasury. If I assume uh, one year holding periods, uh, if uh, 10 year yields rise to 5% within this time frame, 
I'm going to lose around 3%. But if 10 years are going to drop by 100 basis points, so to 3%, I'm going to make around 13%. And that's going to be risk-free. So the 10 years right now, because uh, there has been this uh, huge rise in yields uh, that uh, has also increased that uh, the coupon of these issuance uh, offers a very good risk and reward ratio. This changes uh, if uh, you're going to look at 30-year U.S. treasuries, because if you do the same kind of risk and reward analysis, uh, well, it's going to be much more directional on the pace of interest rate cuts or deflation or disinflation. So if uh, within uh, one year, 30-year U.S. treasuries yields uh, rise uh, by um, 100 basis points, uh, you are going to lose around uh, 20% of your investment. And if they drop by the same amount, uh, you're going to make 15%. So it's a much riskier um, kind of trade. And that's why I see the front part of the yield curve up to 10 years to benefit from such a, from a rotation, let's say, from uh, risky assets uh, to safe assets. Uh, but the long part of the yield curve uh, is really in doubt as it uh, offers no pickup uh, over the 10 years or very slight pickup at 20 basis points or so. Just to reset the room for the remaining 20 minutes, everybody please make sure you follow Altea Spinozzi here on X. If any of you want to come up and ask questions, click that bottom left mic request button. And as always, this will be in podcast under lead lag live. Do you get a sense that, and I understand you're in Denmark, I don't think in the States people really understand how significant uh, a policy shift from the BOJ could be. But do you get a sense that people are talking about it as it, as if it could be a big deal internationally? Because even if they do scrap yield curve control and do raise, you know, out of negatives, that's just an initial move. I mean, I've made this point before. There's no central bank in the world that's more lagged when it comes to inflation, uh, an inflationary response on the Bank of Japan. And that's a, that's a central bank that doesn't even know how to deal with it, uh, given, you know, their own disinflation, deflation for decades. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, the the problem here is that uh, I think that we are going to have uh, two kind of phases when that happens. So the first phase uh, that is going to maybe ben- benefit the U.S. treasuries because it's going to be bearish for Japanese bonds if uh, the Bank of Japan starts to hike rates and exit yield curve control. So maybe within that uh, time frame, it makes sense for investors uh, to buy elsewhere. But then there is going to be a kind of consolidation uh, phase uh, where uh, the Bank of Japan is going uh, to stop hiking uh, and that's going to uh, definitely see some repatriation from uh, U.S. government bonds and European government bonds uh, uh, back home. Um, and uh, just, uh, Michael, just out of interest, uh, when uh, you look at the convenience of Japanese investors to buy either U.S. treasuries or European sovereign bonds, they are better off buying European sovereign bonds because they, vis-a-vis from U.S. treasuries, once edged against the yen, they basically provide a higher yield. Help me out with uh, a narrative disconnect that I I keep harping on. So um, AI is all the rage. And I am skeptical because I keep making this point that if AI is the next, let's call it industrial revolution, you have to be bullish on bonds because technology is inherently disinflationary, maybe even deflationary, and AI is supposed to be this exponential uh, force. And yet yields haven't really moved all that much on that narrative. It's still being driven by you know, at least near-term inflation concerns and the Fed. Am I often thinking that there's a divergence in in the story around the AI and what that should imply for bonds broadly? I think, yeah, you are spot on. I think that uh, the play you are talking about uh, is going to materialize, but is going to be a very much like long-term play. Right now, the bond market uh, is focused only on inflation. And the reason for that is that inflation is driving yields, is driving uh, nominal yields, uh, um, across the bo- uh, across the uh, the world. So if uh, inflation is not resolved, if inflation is not going to go 
to 2%, that easily, it might mean that the neutral rate, long-term neutral rate is going to be above 2.5%. And that's going to change the valuation for all tenors across the EM curve. I want to make an example on the 70s when we had very high inflation, very high unemployment and low growth. So basically, as we can basically identify it as a stagflation was intensifying. So basically, the economy was weaker and weaker, but inflation was not going back or basically descending fast towards 2%. U.S. Treasury nominal yields continue to rise. And that, that sets an example that until inflation is not dead, the focus on bond market will continue to be inflation, even if uh, the Federal Reserve is telling us that the focus uh, should be on a soft landing. And that has been what been. And that is increasing volatility in bond markets, especially on the long part of the year curve. And Michael, on that point, on the long part of the yield curve and short part of the yield curve kind of uh, point of view, I want to make the example of the two-year U.S. Treasury, which I think that now offers a win solution for all kind of investors. Because you see, if I assume a holding period of six months, I need uh, two-year yields to go from 4.5% to 6.3% before starting uh, to record a negative re uh, return. So basically, the two, it's almost impossible uh, to lose money within this part uh, of uh, the yield curve. The only way that it's uh, possible to, lo to lose money in this part of the yield curve is, is if the Federal Reserve hikes another six times, which right now doesn't look probable, especially with China being in, uh, in deflation and probably uh, Europe joining deflation uh, in the second part of the year. Uh, okay, so that, that's a good direction to go. The deflationary effect of China, I'd say more than Europe, but we can debate that. H has it been surprising at all that China hasn't taken out like a bazooka to try to counter the deflationary forces? Or is there maybe a realization that they can't do much because of how much debt they have in general? I think that what's happening in China is that one uh, policymakers just don't want to end up like uh, Japan. And that's why they're basically letting uh, the real estate bu bubble to burst and they are not actively helping uh, the economy. The consequences it will have uh, uh, globally can be can be massive and we will see one of the first consequences uh, probably in Europe where we see basically inflation uh, to be fast returning uh, to 2% uh, and uh, people starting to talk about uh, deflation in the, in the second part of the year. Uh, let's be clear that the ECB could have already cut rates, uh, but it didn't so because uh, I still concern uh, that uh, in terms of uh, euro currency, uh, a devaluation of the currency will bring uh, again uh, a rebound of inflation because everything is put in the US dollars. But I think that the re direction is going to be that one um, going forward. Yeah, and actually, I, I would I would think if somehow China decided to reverse their mindset on that and create a short term inflationary boom, then commodities would run, and that then uh, really would force the Fed's hand to resume the, the rate hike cycle just because of the cost push inflationary side of the equation. Absolutely. But so far, you know, like 2023 has been full of bets around uh, China and we didn't see any of those materializing. So it's a very much, it's a very kind of unsafe bet right now. I think that it's better to think as of to take out China in the equation and uh, and basically focus on domestic uh, kind of trends. And also, Michael, if you think about the U.S. election, and that can be inflationary as well, right? Because uh, both candidates uh, are going to increase uh, fiscal spending. Uh, and in the case of Trump, uh, uh, we might get uh, even uh, a geopolitical uh, rise in tensions and that's going to be bad uh, or well it's going to basically increase prices uh, of, of goods so that can be like our deflationary risk uh, looking ahead the u.s election rather than uh, china 
basically rebounding or cover uh, the, the Bank of China to help the economy. You mentioned um, uh, the Eurozone and, and Germany in particular. And going back to 2011, Germany was the poster child for arguing for austerity right, rather than trying to save the sovereign debt crisis back then. And now, they, as I have seen, they're in a recession, even though the markets have actually done pretty well. Any thoughts on, on opportunities when it comes to the bunds relative to treasury? Is they too, from what I've seen, tend to act in a risk-off way when you have high volatility, meaning there's that flight to safety dynamic that you see in the U.S., you also see it in Germany. I don't think it's a uniform response, but what are your thoughts on Germany? Well, Germany, the problem with bunds in general is that there is a, a massive scarcity of collateral in Europe. And that's why normally when... Uh, uh, we have uh, some dovish remarks. It can be even from the Federal Reserve. Uh, the boons are going uh, to be more sensitive uh, to such remarks uh, than other uh, European sovereigns uh, uh, out there. I think that, honestly, we have uh, seen uh, the um, uh, government, uh, politicians in Germany arguing uh, for uh, more fiscal spending. Uh, but so far, it has not been... Uh, that great in order to affect uh, the availability of boons in the market. So I honestly think that uh, the boons is going to be, you know, like a better safe haven, especially like uh, when we look at where uh, the economic, the European macroeconomic backdrop stands versus uh, the U.S. Uh, than uh, U.S. treasuries. But said that, Michael, uh, everything is connected and uh, the correlation between U.S. treasuries and bonds is positive. So it's going to be very unlikely uh, if we see a rebound of uh, the long part, uh, let's say 10-year U.S. treasury yields, that uh, bond yields uh, will not follow. But, you know, like in terms of resilience and volatility, uh, they are going to be definitely a better investment. So on that, on that point about the correlations positive, uh, is there historical evidence that the correlation of credit spread movements in the Eurozone is is there when it comes to U.S. Uh, corporate credit. So as I understand it, the Eurozone credit spreads have been widening while ours in the U.S. have been, you know, obviously tightening and at these kind of cycle lows when you look at junk. I, is there a, a correlation there? And, and is there maybe even a lag? Because maybe you're, the Eurozone if that's the dynamic, it's sort of a leading indicator of what comes next for corporate credit in the U.S. Yeah, well, the thing is that in terms of European corporate bond spreads, they haven't really been widening. They have been stabilizing somewhat higher while uh, basically U.S. corporate bond spreads continued to tighten. And the reason for that can be explained very much from the macroeconomic backdrop that we see uh, in Europe, uh, we are basically in a, in, in a recession um, and uh, the economy is uh, expected uh, to improve, but at a much uh, lower pace uh, than what uh, uh, was forecasted uh, earlier. So we are going to be stuck in this kind of uh, stagflation mode, which is negative uh, for corporate bonds. And that's why investors are demanding a higher spread than uh, the U.S., but you are completely right. Uh, when uh, there is a correlation between uh, corporate bond markets in the U.S. and in Europe, uh, and uh, when uh, we have uh, some problems in the U.S., uh, that is going uh, to spread very fast, uh, even in Europe. And we had uh, that kind of confirmation uh, during the SVB crisis, uh, uh, where, well, uh, the kind of concerns were surrounding uh, only U.S. banks. And, and that spread anyway to the European space. Uh, I'll tell you, for those who want to track more your thoughts, more your work, I understand with Saxo Bank, you're putting a lot of content out probably for institutional clients of yours, but uh, where can people track some of your, your thoughts? I'm posting uh, a lot uh, on uh, Twitter. Uh, um, a lot of time I also post uh, articles. Uh, the majority of my analyses uh, are available uh, on uh, uh, the Saxo website. So definitely you can uh, follow me and you can look at uh, the publication there. I normally talk about uh, European rates, uh, uh, U.S. Treasury rates, and also U.K. rates. Uh, so if uh, any interest, you can definitely look me up. All right, please make sure you give Altea here a follow. I have another space coming up, so stay tuned for that. And uh, for those that are not going to join the next one, I feel sorry for you.
So anyway, <laughs> thank you, Altea. I appreciate it. Thank you, Michael, for inviting me and good luck for the next speaker. Cheers, everybody.